Tanga from uh, University of Rostock, who is the chief medical officer for um, Vital Therapies. Vital Therapies is the company that's um, developed, I, I, would, I don't want to say marketing because it's, it's not yet a marketable, yeah. yeah, it's still under investigational studies, but the ELAD um, extracorporeal liver support system for which we have several um, principal investigators here at this institute or with our department who are involved in some of the studies and uh, I, I handed, I got a few of the pamphlets out. Um, he's been involved um, with extracorporeal systems for a number of years. I'll let him elaborate on that. Um, but he's going to talk to us uh, basically about the ILOD system and some of the studies that are available here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, should we turn the light off or? Okay, yeah, good morning. My name is Jan Stange and I want to talk to you about uh, extracorporeal liver support, not only about the ELAT system, which is a bioartificial human cell based therapy, but also um, since we're all working in this field now. What was the actual background of extracorporeal liver support? The initial intentions, what did we have when we started off all of that more than 20 years ago and where we are today? Um, my primary um, place of work was the University of Rostock where we invented the MARS device, which is an albumin dialysis machine. Uh, turned out to be the leading detoxification machine for liver failure patients today in the world. But it has clear limitations, and I will also talk about that. That's the reason why we moved forward towards bioartificial systems. And I'm very honored to be here today in Texas, uh, although today is Friday the 13th. So, um, uh, and I have to fly back today, so I hope, um, you, you, I hope everything will be okay. So in this uh, talk... Uh, okay, yeah. Well, th this is not my first rodeo. And, Actually, my girlfriend is a former rodeo writer from here. Uh, she lives in San Diego now, so I, I have to go back alive today. Um, so where did we come from? What was the original rationale of liver support when uh, the pioneers started with that actually 40 years ago? And then uh, we also talk about what we have today and what it can do and what it cannot do. And uh, I would also like to uh, show you that our perception of liver failure as a status of endogenous intoxication has changed a little bit towards uh, uh, centering the albumin function in the middle of that, and that is affected by the toxins that overload the albumin. And last not least, um, due to the limitations that you have if you only do detoxification therapy with extracorporeal liver-like machines, um, why we have to move forward to bioartificial devices. It's not just the complexity of liver failure, it is also the fact that uh, bioartificial devices can actually um, induce a recovery of the patient's own liver. And I think that would be the holy grail. So this is where we will talk about ELAD. So first of all, why did we start the detoxification thing? Um, chronic liver failure, many of those patients are compensated, you know that. Usually it's some precipitating event that pushes them into liver failure. It can be a bleeding, an infection, an alcoholic hepatitis. It's uh, the massive intake of alcohol. So those patients are in liver failure. And um, as long as you don't have end-stage cirrhosis with bridging fibrosis in the biopsy, there's still a chance if it's the liver cells that are damage the liver cells itself, that they can recover by means of uh, regeneration. And um, what you need for that is cells that are capable to recover the liver tissue. And what you also need for that is that you have some metabolic environment that allows those cells to recover. And herein lies the problem in liver failure, which is basically a vicious cycle. Because the nature of liver failure is that toxins accumulate due to the incapability of the liver to metabolize these toxins. And they do two pretty nasty things. The one is that those toxins in a vicious cycle continue to damage uh, the hepatocytes. It's known that if you have bile acid levels higher than 50 micromole per liter in your blood, which is not that much, 
that it can already promote apoptosis in liver cells. This has been very nicely shown by Greg Gores in the Mayo Clinic. And secondarily, and I think uh, all clinicians will appreciate that, my background is actually internal medicine, um, kidney and liver, is that uh, you have all those secondary organ dysfunctions because of the toxins. They cause hepatic encephalopathy, they are vasodilators, so you have hyperperfusion of the organs. The first organ where you see that is basically my specialty. It's the kidneys. And then you have this mixture of hepatorenal syndrome, but also acute renal failure because the toxins are also damaging the tubular cells. So there's very rare something like a clean hepatorenal syndrome. It's very frequent, a combined um, acute tubular necrosis with hepatorenal syndrome and hypoperfusion due to hemodynamic um, insufficiency. Uh, the toxins harm the bone marrow, harm the immune cells, and uh, everybody knows that those patients are way more prone to sepsis because of the immune system that is affected. And all those things are obviously not really supporting an environment where a liver can recover and regenerate. And that was the idea of removing toxins that accumulate in liver failure by detoxification. So what is specific of those toxins, uh, the, the healthy liver, as you know, removes mostly toxins that are bound to albumin. And uh, in the liver, basically by detoxification, it uncouples the toxins from the albumin. And physiologically, how, how this works is when you go deep into the liver lobulus, you have those sinusoids with the uh, channels with the sinusoidal uh, blood vessel. And the endothelial cells there have huge holes, different than in other organs. And the holes basically keep the blood cells inside but uh, albumin, other than in other vessels, can actually travel through those holes, and that brings the albumin into direct surface contact of the liver cell. And that's important because the toxins that are metabolized by the liver are given of the albumin through the membrane into the liver cell, detoxified, and then the albumin travels back, basically um, unloaded of those toxins. <laughs> if, if you have liver failure, that is the process that doesn't work anymore. The liver cell cannot detoxify, the toxin stays on the albumin, and over the period, you basically really have an accumulation of toxins per albumin molecule. So the patient starts to get jaundiced and uh, accumulates those toxins. Um, it has been well established that there are numerous toxins, uh, not just metabolites of small and medium fatty acids. Um, SIVA, many years ago, was the first describing octanoid and hexanoid fatty acids as part of the toxins that induce hepatic coma, metabolize of aromatic amino acids, tryptophan, uh, which is an indole molecule, uh, bilirubin is of course important, but also vasodilators, nitric oxide binds to albumin, and other vasoactive substances that derive from uh, prostaglandins and uh, leukotrienes. And uh, the relation between those toxins and the secondary clinical complications that um, really endanger your patient and can actually cause death uh, as shock or secondary hepatorenal syndrome, hepatic encephalopathy all the way to liver coma, has been well established. So the pathophysiological meaningfulness of toxins is more or less undoubted today. Um, so what can we do to treat that? So the first dialysis machines, of course, only can remove water-soluble toxins. You cannot remove albumin-bound molecules with a dialysis machine because the albumin does not fit through the pores of a dialysis membrane, and it shouldn't because you don't want to remove all the albumin of the patient. So that doesn't work, and that's why detoxification specialists came up with those new era of detoxification machines. One is the albumin dialysis machine, uh, MARS, Prometheus is, uh, looks pretty much the same. Technology is very different, though, because uh, in Prometheus, the pores are actually enlarged, and then they try to remove the albumin-bound toxins by perfusing the albumin toxin complex over sorbent. So it's kind of a selective plasma perfusion therapy. And then there's a lot of new stuff coming up in the next years that uh, you will probably hear about. So, as I said, albumin dialysis is the one therapy that made it actually to FDA approval in 2012. And what you do there is you still use a dialysis membrane, which is impermeable to the albumin itself, but you add albumin into the dialysate solution. 
and you use a very specific type of dialysis membrane, meaning that uh, the outside of that membrane has to be so open, like Swiss cheese almost, that the albumin molecule, which is 65,000 Dalton approximately, can permeate into the membrane from the outside and get into close contact to what we in dialysis call the inner layer of a dialysis membrane. And the inner layer, that's the actual membrane that uh, regulates what can pass through and what cannot pass through. And that thickness of that membrane is only 100 nanometers. And 100 nanometers is a distance that actually a toxin can jump from the albumin and on the blood side and actually go over to the albumin and the dialysis side. That's the key, and that's why you can see here very nicely clean albumin going in into the dialyzer, and it comes out thickly jaundiced. Um, you, you would not have that if you would do just water dialysis. The albumin almost acts like soap if you wash aggressively lipophilic toxins. And um, the, the technique, when you really look into that, also is based on this thin layer membrane. The thin layer membrane also has the capability to absorb those toxins from the albumin molecule on the blood side. And then what you do is basically get clean albumin from the other side, and the clean albumin takes off those toxins from the membrane. So we know today that the membrane physical chemistry itself is also kind of a catalyzer of loosening the toxin albumin complex binding on the blood side and allowing it to go over to the dialysis site. So you can remove those toxins. And um, since albumin is expensive uh, in the US, even more than in Europe, I just learned, uh, it's not thrown away like normal dial dialysate. Uh, it's expensive soap, you have to recycle it. So it gets dialyzed and there's two different sorbents that grab the toxins from the dialysate albumin in order to make it possible to reuse it again. So the clinical effects that we saw, the first was that you can really reduce the number of worsening uh, hepatic encephalopathy and the number of patients who suffer from worsening of renal function. That was the first group, basically most alcoholic cirrhotic patients with acute decompensation published in Hepatology 2002. And um, that, that was the first indicator that you can improve um, hemodynamics, mean arterial blood pressure, patients developed less encephalopathy. So we went to the US and the first indication that was studied on an FDA controlled study was um, acute hepatic coma in chronic cirrhotic patients. Um, and that was led by uh, the University of San Diego by my friend Tarek Hassanin. Uh, we had uh, seven sites, almost seven patients. And what we saw is patients with hepatic coma grade three and four, so that's pretty advanced hepatic coma. Uh, more than 50% were already intubated for airway protection. And the goal was, if you treat every day for five days, can you have the patients improve by at least two grades uh, earlier and more frequent? Improvement by two grades basically means if you have stage four coma, you cannot wake up the patient, he's ventilated. Um, if he improves by two grades, you can actually talk to the patient. Same if you come in as grade three, he has to improve to grade one. That's a clinically pretty impressive improvement. The reason we did that is that hepatic coma or encephalopathy as a primary endpoint is highly under discussion because FDA would say it's very subjective and when doctors come in they usually say, oh, this is a two to three stage coma. Uh, we wanted to have a clear, impressive clinical improvement. That's why this at least two grades. And um, you may know that um, we also developed an SOP based on the West Haven criteria that really gave every patient a defined HE grade. So there was nothing like three, two, four, or one, two, two. Um, it was a clear cut definition. And uh, it was significant at the end. FDA uh, accepted the study, uh, cleared this device for the treatment of acute hepatic coma in 2012. So it's available in the US. Uh, it was sold by Gambro. Gambro got now bought by Baxter. So it's a Baxter therapy that you can actually have. One thing that we didn't expect to be so dramatic when we in invented that was that um, detoxification actually improves hemodynamics. So the first indications that we had was that patients with a low mean arterial blood pressure, many cirrhotics, as you know, have mean arterial pressures less than 60, less than 55, 
millimeter mercury. Uh, if patients get on treatment, you can actually see an improvement of the mean arterial pressure. Um, then we learned, is it really a specific toxin that you have to remove? Or what role does the albumin molecule play in, uh, in this organ intercommunication? Many people today look at albumin as, yeah, we know it binds some toxins and some substances, transports them, but mostly it's binding water and is important for your collate oncotic pressure, maintaining blood pressure. And um, what we learned with detoxification of albumin-bound toxins is it's more than that because you have always substances that are uh, potentially toxic vasoactive substances. And as long as you have a working liver, clean albumin comes through the circulation and covers those substances. And what happens in liver failure is that the overloading, you remember the beginning of the talk, the overloading of the albumin basically prevents from the albumin in a jaundiced patients to bind those substances in the circulation. And this is why those substances accumulate in all those organs where you see then the effects, like the kidneys in the tissue of the brain and the tissue of your hemodynamic system. And it causes vasodilation, hepatic encephalopathy, and renal dysfunction. And what we try to do with Detoxification of liver failure is reinstating the capability of the albumin molecule of a jaundiced intoxic or endogenous intoxicated patient by removing those albumin-bound toxins. Um, can you bind this albumin binding status? Can you, can you measure the albumin binding function? And uh, yes, you can. Uh, from pharmacology, they do all the time when they develop a new drug, they have to know what is the albumin binding rate, what's the biological availability of that. So there are those methods where you can actually measure the unbound substance of an albumin, a fine albumin bound substance. And what you do is you have the sample of the patient and you put a marker on it, a marker that you can measure by fluorescence and the, album, the marker wants to bind to the albumin binding site and then you mix the sample and then you filter the protein-free ultrafiltrate out of it, and then you measure the concentration of that fluorescent marker in this ultrafiltrate. So if your albumin of the patient has a very good binding capacity, you will not find that marker here. You have a very low signal. However, in a very diseased patients where the albumin is already overloaded, um, you have a lot of this unbound marker here because the patient's albumin cannot bind it. That's the theory, and we did that in a clinical study published it, and what we found is that um, indeed the um, albumin binding capacity of patients in child C uh, decompensated cirrhosis or basically patients close to transplant, when you compare that to 100%, which is normal donor population from blood banking, it's reduced to almost 50%. So the liver failure patient can only bind 50% of the toxins that are available in the circulation. And all those free toxins are basically biologically available to the tissue and cause damage. If you do albumin dialysis in the treated group, you can step by step increase this binding capacity up to 80%. We are still not able to make it all the way up to healthy uh, patients. And I think this is where the challenge for development for detoxification in the future is. What is important is that we found that if you cannot improve that within seven days um, to improve it above 40%, then those patients have a very high mortality. And only in those patients where you're successful in improving and reinstating albumin binding capacity, you have a better outcome, a, high, uh, a better uh, survival rate. So that's basically a good marker for the efficacy of detoxification in liver failure as a treatment of liver failure. An unexpected effect also of uh, detoxification with albumin dialysis was that patients who came with intractable pruritus, there were patients who had primary biliary cirrhosis, primary sclerosing, cholangitis, who were already on extended drug treatment and still had intractable itching to the degree that they threatened to kill themselves, 
um, with albumin dialysis, within three days of treatment, the itching score um, was reduced dramatically. And surprisingly, when you stop the treatment after three days, 80% stay with bearable itching for almost two to three months. So in London and in uh, Barcelona now, there's actually <coughs> programs where intractable pruritus patients can go to travel um, every two to three months, and it's reimbursed even by the uh, UK health system. And if even the UK health system reimburses something, it has to work. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, if, if you look at the efficacy of detoxification, so a lot of randomized studies have shown it does improve hemodynamics. There's at least six controlled studies about hemodynamic effects of that. It does improve kidney function which is logical because if you do improve the hemodynamics of a liver failure patient, chances is that his kidneys can recover. Um, and it can reduce the jaundice, that's obvious, removes uh, the bilirubin, clearly improves hepatic coma, um, and the intention is really try to not to have your patient too long intubated and ventilated, and it can improve pruritus. The survival data only in the few studies where we had small populations, very well defined, we saw uh, a difference in survival and an improvement of the kaplan meier curve. That's end-stage hepatorenal syndrome type one in a population that didn't get transplanted over, seven, over 30 days. <laughs> that is uh, acute alcoholic hepatitis published in hepatology. Uh, again, very narrow population, non-responders to classical therapy. Um, the sad part is after 30 days, if they continue their lifestyle, you don't have a difference within three months. Um, and that's the population in the acute hepatic coma. Um, those patients who had a MELT score higher than 30, we had a split of the Kaplan-Meier curve. However, it's all still not significant in large trials where you enroll a wide variability of patients. This is from the um, detoxification registry patients survival expectancy based on MELT scores. Um, here you see the, uh, the green ones are the expected survivals on MELT scores as it would be theoretically. The yellow columns are what we actually observed when patients were detoxified. Um, the European uh, trial, the relief trial, uh, where they basically put every single end-stage cirrhotic patient into the trial, there was only a split of the curve as long as the treatment went on when the treatment was stopped within 30 days, you didn't have an effect. And I think that's the challenge. Design the right study population for a study like that. Um, the authors of that, it's published now in, a, in hepatology, basically concluded it's a design problem, but also maybe that our detoxification methods today are not effective enough because we need better albumin. The industrial albumin that you can buy is already overloaded with uh, fatty acids and other industrial stabilizers. Uh, the sorbents are not perfect, the membranes are not perfect. So there will be clearly new developments in the market. And there's already one new system in, in Germany under clinical uh, use right now. And we hope with more improvement of albumin function, we will get there that we have better survival data also at least on treatment. So the message from that is we do have clinical meaningful effects, but in order to prolong survival, we will need some measure to help the patient's own liver to improve. And that means we need to select the population that can improve. And that brings me to ELAT. So ELAT, um, I, I remember the first presentation of ELAT was uh, in development from Texas, uh, our friend Norman Sussman from Houston presented on an ASAO conference. It was 91, uh, same conference I gave my first talk on Mars in a jaundiced patient, and we reduced bilirubin and thought that would be a big breakthrough in the hepatology world. Um, people were like nice to us, but the real rock star was Suspin. He presented the first use of a bioartificial cartridge based on a hepatoma cell line, treated a 14-year-old girl with a uh, drug-induced acute hepatic failure. She survived, and everybody thought, that's it. We have a bioartificial liver. Um, as you know, over the years, this has experienced a number of trials, and uh, never the trials could be actually completed because the companies in the past were not capable of raising the amount of money that you need in order to have a development like that. This is a big program. 
Um, however, today we are in the lucky situation that the company could convince with the past um, clinical results and is very well financed now. It's on NASDAQ since April and started a first study in a population where we think the liver is actually recoverable and that is acute alcoholic hepatitis. Different than end-stage cirrhosis, it's really a, more a part of cellular damage, and that should be able to recover. So the device has 440 grams of uh, C3A cells, and the cells can mimic a lot of biological functions of uh, hepatocytes, and we can talk about the cells later. And uh, I came in contact with that after uh, basically Baxter took over the albumin dialysis machine. They asked me to conduct uh, the data safety monitoring board process for their phase 2B trial. And that was in patients with acute on chronic hepatitis, but it was the first time that consequently in the design of the trial, mm -hmm. there was a difference made between patients who have end-stage cirrhosis decompensated by a precipitating event like infection or bleeding, and then acute alcoholic hepatitis, which in my opinion is a total different entity. And uh, there were a lot of sites participating in that, and um, the, the inclusion criteria roughly were basically the diagnosis had to be either alcoholic hepatitis or acute and chronic liver failure precipitated by something else, and uh, patients had MELT scores between 18 and 35, so there was an upper cap, and patients had to have consent. And exclusion criteria, uh, a little bit more um, selective. So patients with risk for bleeding, less than 50,000 platelets, uh, dialysis um, requiring patients, high INRs were excluded, and then patients basically who had any kind of contraindication for extracorporeal circuits. So if they were already in septic shock, were already bleeding, so that you can't administer anticoagulation, which you have to with devices like that. All those patients were basically um, excluded and also transplanted patients were excluded. Um, the events that were observed, pretty nothing that would stick out of what you would see in any extracorporeal treatment of those patients. So although this is a biological therapy with a hepatoma cell line, what you see is still the typical effects that uh, there's risk of bleeding, there's risk of hemodynamic effects because you have an extracorporeal circuit stealing volume from the patient, and there's a risk of catheter-related uh, bleedings or infections. And um, what was observed is that in the population that had acute alcoholic hepatitis, there was a pretty encouraging split of the Kaplan-Meier curve so the company went back to the FDA and said, well, obviously the stratification was a good idea because we have an effect in acute alcoholic hepatitis patients who can recover, but not in end-stage cirrhotics. Can we continue just with this one arm? And FDA said, that, that is a good idea, but you need to restart with a new study. And that's basically what uh, the company did. So uh, when we looked into the data, the, the conclusion is, it was effective in acute alcoholic hepatitis, and um, that's why the company decided to continue with the first exclusively alcoholic hepatitis, including patients, and that is the Vital Therapy Study 208, which just uh, concluded the enrollment of 203 patients as of January 31st, and I can talk about that later. Um, so our hypothesis when we started the 208 study was Non-alcoholic induced acute on chronic has usually precipitating events like infections or bleeding. The European Cliff Consortium, the Chronic Liver Failure Consortium, looked into the different types of acute on chronic liver failure, and now they are really placing alcoholic hepatitis in a very separate category than cirrhotic patients that decompensate with complications of portal hypertension, if you want so. And uh, what we thought is in alcoholic hepatitis, for some reason, the C3A cells are capable of recovering the inflamed hepatocytes. That's the medical background. And if you, if you look at that, to the left side, patients who have acute liver failure, everybody agrees that theoretically they could recover because liver can regenerate. If you have patients with chronic liver disease, for instance, due to alcohol, 
starting with steatosis, it turns into fibrosis, finally you have somewhere in cirrhosis. In between, at any time, they can have an episode of alcoholic hepatitis. And the key question is, as early as this happens, when they have acute alcoholic hepatitis and fulfill the criteria for high mortality, the high MEDRI score with high bilirubin, high INR, it, it's not related whether they are here in the disease process or here. The difference is when it happens here, they can actually recover, and if they stay away from alcohol, they can have a long life. And alcoholic hepatitis, again, different than end-stage cirrhotic, is a systemic inflammatory disease which is induced by the acute alcohol intoxication. And ELAT, as a cell-based therapy, can actually do more than just detoxifying like the albumin dialysis machine. Because what we know is that the cells produce a lot of proteins. And I think this is the unique point in ELAT. When you look into the um, excretory proteome in the media of C3A cells cultures, a lot of those molecules that come out are basically acute phase response proteins, anti-inflammatory proteins, and also growth factors that can induce um, regeneration of the patient's own hepatocytes. Uh, this was a work by the US military, by the way, not done by the company. So they did a mass spec proteomic analysis of what the C3A cells do actually produce. And uh, what is interesting is this reaction of the cells is specific to the patient. So depending on the IL-6 levels and the interleukin-1 levels of the patient and the TNF levels of the patient, as more inflamed he is, as more those cells will switch over to an acute phase response mode and help basically the patient's own liver to recover. So that's our hypothesis, that we can see that um, in acute alcoholic hepatitis, patients do respond to the C3A therapy, but we need to support that with uh, future studies. And that actually brings me to, although we have concluded the first alcoholic hepatitis study in those patients, I would like to show you um, the um, criteria for the follow-up study, because there will be a follow-up study since FDA required a confirmatory study. And that is the study 210. Um, and I will also show you the difference between that protocol and, and the 208 study. So this is the study where you, you can participate now. It's uh, in severe alcoholic hepatitis. It used to say uh, in this confirmatory study, because it was designed in cooperation with the European authorities, that those need to be alcoholic hepatitis patients who have failed even steroid therapy. Because when we designed the study two years ago, the Europeans still totally believed in steroids have some effects. So they wanted us to do steroid failure therapy. Um, that was the initial title, randomized. It's an open-label study, multi-center study, and controlled, uh, but open-label, because we cannot have a, a placebo ELAT machine. It wouldn't be ethical to expose patients to extracorporeal circuits and catheters without actually providing a therapy. Um, again, that's the ELAT machine. Those pictures are a little, little bit prettier. Um, it is based on an a uh, hard lung assist machine, but that's mostly because the cells, the 400 grams of cells, they need a two liter per minute flow of um, the media circulating it in order to maintain the oxygen that the cells need. You can actually measure uh, how the cells breathe, and you can see on this screen how much oxygen the cells are consuming, which is a proof that they are actually alive. Um, that is the scheme of the circuit. So the patient has a very dialysis-like extracorporeal loop with a pump. Here's the filter. Uh, what is different to dialysis is that that specific filter has a pore size that allows albumin to pass through at a certain amount, but any other larger proteins like fibrinogen are not allowed to go through. So this is what we say as a cutoff of 100,000, 120,000 Dalton. So large proteins cannot go through. And they go then in what we call the bioreactor loop, which is driven by this hard lung machine um, impeller pump with an oxygenator, making sure the cells get enough oxygen. 
and here is where the cells produce proteins and uh, metabolize uh, molecules. And then in the return line, there's only a cell filter. So all the proteins that come out of the cells go back into the venous line of the patient, go back into the patient. And um, we, we know today the cells are um, capable of fulfilling a lot of the um, functions that hepatocytes have. They can produce hepatocyte-like proteins, process toxins. They do contain P450 enzymes. And uh, I think most important is really the production of immune modulatory and acute phase response proteins, but also growth factors encouraging the patient's own liver to recover. Um, we know also they do some um, clotting coagulation factors, but also um, antithrombin-3, and as I said, immune modulatory components and acute phase response proteins, alpha 1 antihumotrypsin, alpha 1 antitrypsin. So the study uh, that we do now, again, um, it's a comparison between treating patients with this extracorporeal device and the control arm gets standard of care, whether it has steroids in it or not. And the primary endpoint, again, will be the survival at day 91. Um, there will be post-discharge evaluations all the way up to the primary endpoint time. This is 91 days. Um, patients will undergo an alcohol path test. Um, the site conducting the study will not see the results. That's just an important covariate, of course, for the 90 days survival, whether they start drinking at day 60 or not. So we will have those data. And then after that, we have a follow-up that basically goes all the way um, to five years. There will be home health visits in both arms. Um, maybe this by itself will be beneficial for the patient, but it will not introduce a bias because you do it in both arms. And then the follow-up will make sure that within five years, not only how the five-year survival is all over, but also after five years, do those hepatoma cells have any effect in inducing secondary cancer? What I can tell you from the over 250 patients that have been on the machine so far, there hasn't been any indication that cells escaped and uh, caused cancer in the patient. But as you remember, there were all kinds of membranes and filters that actually prevent the cells to go back into the patient. Those are the inclusion criteria. Patients have to be uh, older than 18 years. Bilirubin has to be higher than eight milligram per deciliter. There has to be a medical history of alcohol abuse. Um, and uh, the time between the massive alcohol abuse and the presentation of symptoms of alcoholic hepatitis has to be less than six weeks. That's important because we really want the clinical diagnosis of alcoholic hepatitis. The MADRE score has to be higher than 32 because we expect a mortality of more than 50% in the population. That's what we want to improve. And um, the, the diagnosis of alcoholic hepatitis then secondary to the history is based that they have two out of the four, either in an enlarged liver, AST higher than ALT, ascites, or leukocytosis. So you have to have the medical history and two out of those. And this is to make sure mortality will be at least 50%. The MADRE score is a formula. You can go into the internet, put in the bilirubin and your prothrombin time, and those two factors basically come up with a number. And it was, uh, it was by a Texas guy, Willis MADRE, who investigated the efficacy of steroids and found out that if, if you do this formula, it's an integral kind of formula, uh, those patients who have high bilirubin, high INR, and have higher numbers than 32, your expected mortality just by that is 50%. If you have additional hepatorenal syndrome, additional hepatic encephalopathy, mortality is even higher. So that's just a method to make sure you have a population that is at risk, which you need when you want to do a survival trial. There has to be a number of events in your control arm. Um, and then um, in the beginning, there was discussion should those patients have a biopsy to prove that it's really alcoholic hepatitis? Um, unfortunately, it is unrealistic in today's medical world to require a biopsy in every single patient in studies like that. 
um, most of the academic centers kind of said, oh, it's our standard and we have to be accurate and scientific. Reality doesn't allow it. It just doesn't happen. So in the 2.8 study, we have 20% of patients who were actually biopsied. Um, so we said, well, if, if there is a medical indication for biopsy because it would have diagnostic implications and therapeutic implications, and it's ethical to do it, uh, we would love to have a biopsy. But if there is not, because it hasn't, doesn't have consequences, um, then it has to be based on a, on a clinical diagnosis. And the biopsy and not biopsy patients will be stratified in two different arms. Um, in the current version of the protocol, patient must be observed before they can be randomized on standard of care. And as I said, when it was designed, standard of care was a steroid therapy. And then within seven days, you see whether they respond to steroids or not. And that's the Lil model. The Lil model, again, is also a formula where you can put numbers in. Um, other than what it basically does to the Lil model is it looks over seven days whether your bilirubin goes up or down. But there's covariates that you put in with that. So as older the patients are, as more the bilirubin has to go down to tell you he's going to do good. Or as less albumin you have, as more it has to go down. So there are covariates that also play in with how the course of your bilirubin is. But the idea of the Lille score really is you put a patient on steroid, and within seven days, if the bilirubin doesn't trend down, and the idea of maturin was then you stop steroid because if it doesn't work, the added risks with the steroids are actually putting the patient at risk, which was a good idea. So that is how the steroid therapy actually should be done. Um, this will prob most probably change into whether they are on steroids or not, just observe them for seven days with any standard of care therapy. And that is because the latest UK study, the STOPA trial, clearly showed steroids don't have any effect on three months mortality. So we submitted a new amendment of the protocol to the European authorities and said, uh, the, the Lille model is valid whether you're on steroids or any other standard therapy. What we want is non-responding patients to good medical care, whether you do it with steroids or without. Um, subjects then, of course, must be eligible for standard of care treatment. Um, what it basically means is they cannot be on DNR or this, this study is the last resort for the patient. They have to have access to full care. And you need an informed consent, of course. Exclusion criteria, again, the platelet count here uh, has to be even a little bit higher, not 40, but 50,000. That's just because in the European former experiences, this combination, INR higher than three and platelets less than 50,000, was associated with uh, less benefits if you apply extracorporeal therapies like albumin dialysis. Um, as I said, this is a European-based protocol design, which now gets more and more Americanized. We still cut off the MELT score at 35. And this is when you look at the um, meaning of the MELT score for the mortality in alcoholic hepatitis. It's actually a very good predictor of mortality also for alcoholic hepatitis. But if patients have MELT scores higher than 35 in alcoholic hepatitis, the mortality rate goes almost vertical up. So there is no way you can save those patients with anything. Um, and uh, we had the same in the 2.8 study. It turned out to be a very wise decision. Um, evidence of infections that are not responding to the antibiotic treatment that you get. As I said, they are very prone to infections, and it's hard to treat the infections. Uh, what you don't want is patients who are sliding into sepsis and put them on an extracorporeal circuit. Uh, there should be septic shock. There shouldn't be positive cultures. And there shouldn't be signs of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Uh, if the patient has clinical symptoms, you need to do the diagnostic tab, exclude that, or treat it. And uh, patients should not have a clinical pneumonia. <clears throat> then um, also, the patients shouldn't, be ha shouldn't have 
any pre-treatments within the last three months. So other than in the 208 protocol, we really want those patients as juvenile as possible, which makes it important that we really reach out to the referring sites that they don't um, sit on those patients for weeks and months before they finally uh, transfer them to the academic centers, which are our trial sites. Um, also, hospital admissions for their chronic liver disease within the last two months. So if he has been in the hospital two months ago because he had refractory ascites or the patient had an esophagus variceal bleeding, in this study we will exclude them because we really want them as early as possible in the process of chronic liver disease. It's the acute alcoholic hepatitis patient that has a chance to recover. That's the one that we want to have. Then hemodynamic and stable patients, uh, other than the, than in the 208 protocol, this is pretty uh, extensively des, um, described what we define as hemodynamic instability. So the mean arterial pressure shouldn't be less than 60. And if it is, try to challenge it with volume. If they respond to that, you can still enroll the patients. But uh, if they are on any presser support already, those are the um, upper limits that should not be exceeded for the patient in order to enter the study. Um, patients should not have active bleeding. So even if you don't see the bleeding, if you have a drop of uh, hematocrit that you need more than two bags of blood every day to maintain it, you have to suspect there's some internal bleeding going on. Those patients love to bleed in the peritoneum, into the retroperitoneum, and we need to exclude that before we put them on the machine because it will requ require heparinization in many cases. Um, the portal vein should not be thrombosed or occluded. Um, any concomitant diseases that put the patient at risk to, to die for some other reason within three months should also be excluded. So no severe cardiopulmonary diseases, no cancer that will kill you within three months. Um, also, and that is the same that we did in the 208 study, um, and, and it was a long discussion with investigators, our clinical advisory boards, scientific advisory boards. So if we don't have the biopsy, how do we make sure that this liver has a chance to recover? And the best everybody came up with exclude those who have already shrunken small cirrhotic livers. So there's a liver size detection, either by ultrasound, has to be at least 10 centimeters medioclavicular in the, um, in the craniocaudal extension, or if you have bad visibility, uh, try to do a scan, make sure it's not less than 750 milliliters. Um, in the 2.8 study, that worked very well, and I'm pretty confident that we have not one single patient in the 2.8 study who was end-stage cirrhotic. Uh, having said that, doesn't really mean that the patient cannot have already some degree of cirrhosis in his liver. Um, patients who are already on dialysis for end-stage renal disease cannot be included. Patients with the seizures, this is because it could be a uh, complication of withdrawal and alcoholic hepatitis that can cause additional covariate risks should be excluded. Um, positive ser serologies for any other chronic hepatitis with viruses have to be excluded. Patients should not be pregnant. Participation in another investigational drug. Um, it, well, believe it or not, in the 2.8 study, we had one patient who turned out to be pregnant before we, yeah, right, you, you're absolutely right, but it happened. And uh, that's why we look at this test before we randomize. Luckily, that patient never got randomized, but it does happen. And impressive, and if you consider the physiology, patients cannot be in another study that is randomized because that adds another covariate. I think that's a standard exclusion criterion. And they cannot be listed or planned for to be transplanted within 90 days. I know the rules basically don't allow you to do that anyways, uh, but there are sites that are sometimes planning to transplant alcoholic hepatitis patients. So it happened. And um, it, this is a pre-transplant study. I have never seen a liver transplant patient who developed actually alcoholic hepatitis with his transplant but I still hear that sometimes this does happen, and the patient should not have been in a previous ELAT study. 
Um, now that we have done the 2-8 study, there's a chance that you might see patients that have participated in ELOT in Texas before. Um, this is, again, what I said, access to full care. They should not have a DNR status uh, on their uh, forehead. And uh, a, a refusal of the patient to participate in the five-year follow-up at randomization is also an exclusion because we need to know, is this safe uh, from our DSMB data from the 2-8 study, 200 patients, I can tell you that the DSMB has always recommended to continue the study because we didn't see any red flag that puts the treated patients more on risk than the control group. And, uh, and of course, we need to have the chance to follow up on them, so we need to know where they live. So that is the confirmatory study in alcoholic hepatitis. The design is a little bit even more strict than the one that we just concluded in time, successfully with 208 patients. The results of the 2-8 study will not be um, available before the uh, early second half of this year because the patients are still in the 90-year observation period, which is the end point. So at this point, we don't know what the results are yet. There will be a um, um, public announcement, earning call of the company displaying exactly what the publication policy will be for the 2-8 study. And so the, as so far, we don't have anything from the 2-8 study that would change our strategy to continue with that. And I'm very happy for answering any questions now before I try to fly back on Friday 13th. So. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Great question. 208 study, it was continuously, that's why they had to go on the ICU. 24 hours a day for five days. In this study, you are allowed to treat up to 10 days. Um, we would consider a three-day treatment as a valid minimum treatment. If you have to break up for safety reasons earlier, this is not a complete treatment, but they will still be ITT patients. Um, if they have completed three days, let's say after five days, the investigator feels this patient improved so far, I don't want to put the risk of anticoagulation, extracorporeal circuit, catheter infection on him. I can also stop earlier, but you have the right to treat up to 10 days if you think it's needed. How long, how long does that cell line last? Does it get replaced with cartridges? Yes, uh, also a great question. Uh, in approximately 10% of our patients, um, during, during the treatment, what we do is, when the patient is on the treatment, you see the oxygen pressure difference before and after the cells. This tells you that the cells are alive and working. If this difference goes down, which sometimes happens for all kinds of reasons, could be the toxins from the patients, could be inflammatory substances that harm the cells, could be high bile acids. If the oxygen consumption rate goes down, then uh, we exchange the cartridge. This happened in only 10, 15% of the last study but we can replace the cartridge one time. And where does this cell line come from? That's a wonderful question. Um, <laughs> the Hep G2 cell line is very well known. Hep G2 cell line is a hepatoblastoma cell line that came from an Argentinian boy, I think in the 70s or so. Um, but as you know, when you take a biopsy, you have a whole bunch of different cells there. So they grew those cells over years, over years, and it was not a homogeneous cell line. So when I worked with that in my lab, it behaved like a tumor cell. So when they uh, populated the culture flask, the cells would basically get loose and still divide, even if they're not attached. That's tumor-like cell growth. Then the Wistar Institute started sorting all those different cells, and they eliminated one clone, and what this clone did different is when it grows in the culture flask, it stops growing. So it grows contact inhibited. Basically, it's the difference, what you would say, between a transformed cell line and what we used to call immortal cell lines. And they found out once the contact inhibition occurs, the cells switch from grow mode into functional mode and started to produce albumin express cytochrome P450. Um, we will probably 
published later this year that those cells actually form when you put them in a three-dimensional cartridge. And we did uh, electron microscopy uh, um, cuts. We found that they form actually biocanaliculi, which is amazing. So um, this is where the cell comes from. I personally think it's probably a progenitor line. They were really lucky to find that. Um, but uh, we will see how, how effective this is. Because honestly, still, if you put them into a cartridge, it's still not a liver. It doesn't have a bile duct that comes out, which I think would be great. Because where do they clean the, the stuff that they excrete into the biocanaliculi? But the cell itself would have the capability to do that. So just a, a comment and, and, and kind of follow-up question. And this was great when it got shot on birds and on the physiology of, of cephalopathy and diabetes and so forth. And, and I was afraid you'd do PowerPoint so I could do it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. sinusoids and hepatocytes within his sick patient are just completely dysfunctional. Um, that is one reason, because even if you give this albumin, thinking you give them fresh albumin, doing the same like with detoxification, so you can bind all those toxins, the liver still cannot clean it once they are loaded. What is not very well known, and I'm trying to pray that since 10 years to the albumin industry. When the albumin was um, developed as a plasma expander for war in the 30s, they were looking for something that you can transport without in, being in the cooler. And they thought, oh, albumin is a great molecule. But they had to add what they call stabilizers to it. And to make it also virus safe, they have to pasteurize it. So when they isolate the albumin from healthy donors, they add in a, ratio, in a molecular ratio of 10 to 1 stuff that binds to our binding sites. So when you look in the uh, albumin description, it contains 16 millimole per liter caprolate, which is a middle chain fatty acid that Siva published as a bad substance for hepatic coma. And they added another 16 millimole per liter N-acetyl tryptophan, which is another endolic component of endogenous intoxication. So what I'm saying is the commercial albumin when you're in severe liver failure actually harms. We published a paper in liver transplantation on that because we, we divided patients into two groups. One group received for albumin indications in cirrhosis the normal albumin with all this stuff. And in another group, we, uh, we filtered the stabilizers out, the toxins. And they responded much better to the albumin infusion. So I'm saying albumin is good for patients if they are not yet child C. If you're a child A and B, your liver can still deal with the stabilizers. If you're already there where your mitochondria are really damaged, that's where the caprolate has to be metabolized. Caprolate goes up and the blood actually causes more harm than damage. And I think that's why albumin doesn't work as well in the intensive care trials as it does. It's just not good albumin. Where, where was that? Uh, Mayo and Florida. But, um, but so the feedback is about super exciting. The question I have is it, it seems that this were a different study, study to follow a very different group of patients. Are you yes. Sure they're both ongoing trials right now? Yes. The 212 <laughs> study is basically uh, for patients that have acute liver failure or that have resection or that have a primary non function in transplants. It will be a non randomized study, though. And we discussed that with FDA, and FDA absolutely agreed. Because whenever you have an acute failure population, they qualify for high urgency transplant, and it destroys your study design. I mean, the full mass study of Fauzi and France showed that. Uh, he had a positive result with Mars when the patients were waiting for the transplant at least three days. But the majority received the transplant within a day. 
So, so that's why I'm sorry that I didn't talk about the 212. This is, this is an, a non-randomized study for basically an orphan group where you have those three indications. And if we are successful with the 210 and 28, FDA would allow us to use that for a label and extension because this is where a medical need is, but there's no chance to design a trial to prove that it's effective in a randomized way. So that's the 212, yes. So the follow-up question is going to be, by the time you identify a patient, how long does it take in general before you can actually indicate therapy for that patient? Uh, if, the patient is, if the patient is uh, deemed um, enrollable, he can be randomized within 15 minutes, and the machine within the US can be started within, oh, let's say we randomized this morning, treatment could start tomorrow. When you randomize tonight, treatment can, could start tomorrow night. So for the 212 protocol, we will probably not even try to start in the morning. In the alcoholic hepatitis patient, time is not that much of a matter because those patients are not sliding that acutely into death. Um, and, and we found out when the logistics in a hospital are just designed to start things in the morning, you know. But for the full minute study for the 212, we will push as hard as we can to start as soon as we can because they, they die quick. Um, I, yeah, whenever you do that, my experience uh, when we did the Mars trial and, and now also with the ELAT study, um, you do not do the program a favor because FDA absolutely dislikes compassionate use. Their argument, and I have to agree with that actually, is, is they say, if you think this is a population that will benefit from the therapy, submit a protocol, and that's what we did. I would almost call this a compassionate use kind of population, uh, but when you say um, almost all one would, all, everyone would qualify, there's a lot of exclusion criteria too. And uh, so we have already looked at 10 or 12 patients for that and only randomized two so far. But the Mars is FDA approved now. For the treatment of acute hepatic encephalopathy, yes. It is. Not for liver trauma, liver failure, no. from a traumatic injury or something. That's correct. As long as they have a component, yeah, right. As long as they have a component uh, of uh, hepatic coma, great. Through, I don't know what the, I think the label only says acute hepatic encephalopathy and acute and chronic liver failure. And that's actually taken over from another machine that was on the market for the same indication that isn't on the market anymore. It was the charcoal hemoperfusion column. Please. You had the bioreactor where they come from and the Oh yeah, thank you for oh, I forgot the most important thing. So in Mars we tried to teach the centers and they had to do it by themselves with the acute dialysis stuff. It's a little bit complicated, so that was a hassle. In the ELAT study, the bioreactors are produced in Rancho Bernardo in San Diego. So they inoculate those four cartridges with cells within two weeks. They grow up to the 440 gram, and then they can leave them there with a slow circulation bioreactor for six weeks. So we have always approximately eight cartridges in store that can go to the sites. If the site randomizes, they come there within a day, and uh, then there comes a team of three ELAT nurses that are specialized, because this machine is not as simple as a dialysis machine, because it needs monitoring for the oxygen pressure, and they have to take um, microbiology samples, making sure they are not contaminated. And it's a three people team that is constantly here. And out of those three people for 24 hours for the whole treatment time, there will always be one sitting next to the machine. They are not involved in the patient care though. So their responsibility ends with the catheter. Okay. 
Ah, yeah, thank you. Well, so actually, in the European regulatory process, when you apply for um, investigational studies, they demand you to put your plan for children to it. Otherwise, you wouldn't get an approval. So we have a development plan for a device that can be used in children, smaller extracorporeal circuits. The, the key is really not the age. The key is really how much volume, right? So. Yeah. The blood site is uh, very similar to a CVVH circuit. You have probably 250 milliliters outside the body and blood. Uh, and then, of course, you have the ultrafiltrate circuit, which is not really the blood volume, the extracorporeal, but it is some extracorporeal protein. And uh, so we have done minors with the machine, but uh, rarely minors or adults sometimes with a body weight less than 40 kilograms. Um, but we have developed a plan to also supply that to smaller children because we had to. And actually, children have acute liver failure. The, the, the point was, if you study alcoholic hepatitis, there's not many children with alcoholic hepatitis, <laughs> gratefully. So, what do you try to circuit with? Uh, it's when the cells come, they come in a conservation solution with uh, buffer and albumin, and the circuit is primed with saline, which was a problem for a while because I, I learned that, that you have those compartment companies in the US and sometimes they get into trouble with uh, contaminations. So we, we had sites that didn't have enough saline. We had sites that didn't have the calcium that we need. We had problems with heparin and uh, it, was, it was just unbelievable. Oh, so what kind of part? Heparin, yeah. Citrate we cannot use at this point because the cells would suffer from the low ionized calcium. So it's heparin and the heparin Dosing and prescription is the PI's responsibility. Um, I know this is a field in liver patients where you need a little, I'm always um, proposing the start low and then go up. But on the other hand, what you don't want also is, I don't have do heparin at all, and then the circuit clots every three hours. You, you lose more blood than platelets and cause more harm than uh, applying a little bit heparin. So we, we should discuss a heparin uh, procedure. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, it, it goes into the red line, the arterial line of the circuit. But as you know, it is a systemic anticoagulation. So when you put it into the red line, uh, a good point is there, there are people that said, why don't you antagonize it in the blue line with protamin? And uh, there's a protocol, actually, that some sites use for that. And I can supply you with that. Our policy is basically, imagine this is a liver patient that you would have to put on CVVH. You would have to do heparin anticoagulation if you don't do citrate. Citrate here you can't do. So what's your standard, in-house standard for anticoagulation for a cirrhotic patient on CVVH? And that is what you have to apply. Fair? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.